Hi, I'm Mike Bellevue, and today we're back at Duelist End. And our subject this week is Colt's Gorgeous 1851 Navy Revolver, the Robert E. Lee Commemorative 1971. Now this gun has a distinction, or this model, of being the first of the second generation of Colt black powder guns. So let me show you what comes in the commemorative set, and then I'll give you the history of this gun, and then we'll load it up and we'll go shoot it for a while. All right, this is the Robert E. Lee commemorative 1971 uh, set, box set. And for those of you who saw the video two weeks ago, uh, this will be a little bit redundant. I'm certainly not going to cover everything I covered in that video, which is called a first look. And I'll put a link down in the description below. But, but we've got this beautiful walnut case, the Colt medallion. And when we open it up, we've got, of course, the revolver itself, which is beautiful. And then we've got these accoutrements, right? We've got a ball and conical mold. Little key in there for lock of the case. We've got a bag flask, nipple wrench and screwdriver, authentic to the period, I should point out. Reproduction Ely Brothers Cap 10, which I have filled. Well, not filled, but I've got loaded with Remington number 10 caps. And then this tool is a wedge remover. This did not come with the set. I just happen to have it in there. So that's what the case set looks like. If you want some more information on it, then by all means, go check out the video on uh, the Robert E. Lee commemorative first look, and you'll get a lot more info. But now I'm gonna take you through the history of this gun. Well, I think today I want to tell you the story about the second generation Colt Navy revolvers. And by second generation, I mean the second generation Colt Black Powder series. So this was Colt's re-entry into the cap and ball market in the 1970s to start things off. And it all began with this model that we've got right here. So let me give you a little bit of history on that. Val Forja Jr. is the man who basically started the cap and ball replica market. Uh, he went to Italy and he got uh, Uberti involved in Kingdom. making And as they say, the rest is history. And that of course caused a boom in cap and ball revolvers. By the 1960s, a lot of companies were making cap and ball revolvers in Italy. And of course, one of the driving forces in that was the centennial of the American Civil War. And there were battle reenactments and there were things on TV and uh, there was a great deal of interest in the period and that included the guns of the period. And we, we saw the same thing with flintlock shooting uh, during the bicentennial of the American Revolution well, a little bit later. So, you know, these, these milestones always have an effect on the hobby. And cap and ball revolver shooting, for a while, was the fastest growing shooting sport. So, in 1970, Colt was looking at this going on and, and knowing that, you know, they had basically started that market in the 1840s. And they thought, why should the Italians reap all the benefits of that? Uh, there are guns. We did them first. We can do them the best. Well, we should do them again. And the lighting, I'm sorry, it's kind of going back and forth. It's, uh, it's one of those odd days in mid-November. And, you know, as you look around, you can probably see the leaves are all off of the trees now here at Duelist Den. In fact, last night we had our first snowfall, 
Uh, not a great deal of it, and it ended up, after we got a couple inches, it turned to rain and washed a lot of it away, and, and by now, which is, you know, close to noontime, it's all gone here now. But uh, what we're left with is a blustery wind, <laughs> very blustery. In fact, I've got a huge dead cat on my microphone trying to cut the wind sound down, so I hope that works. And that wind is really pushing the clouds around. So we're going from bright sun one second to uh, very cloudy the next second, and I'm jumping up and down, changing neutral density filters to keep the, um, keep the exposure sane on here. So I hope you'll bear with me. So that's gonna be our two crosses to bear today is wind noise, which I hope I got taken care of, and exposure issues, which I'll deal with as best I can. So anyway, back to Val Forget Jr. Um, so Colt's interested in getting back in the market. And Val Forget was very interested in Colt being in the market. He had been four years. Uh, had kind of been proposing this to Colt for some time. And of course, Colt was now ready. So they went to Val who was the, uh, the owner of Navy Arms, head of Navy Arms at the time. And they asked him if he would be the project lead on bringing back the black powder guns. And Val was very interested in that. Uh, now I did not know Val very well, but I knew him a little bit uh, later in his life. I, I know Val III a little bit better, but he's, he's down in West Virginia now mostly doing military surplus, but uh, Val Forger Jr. was a very smart guy. I mean, just very smart. So he tackled this head on, and, uh, and what they did is basically he went to Italy for a few of the major components, and, and I have to tell you, when it comes to these second, you know, the second and third generation guns, there are a lot of misconceptions. There's a lot of bad information out there. A lot of people think these are just hopped up Uberties with a nice Colt finish uh, that are way overpriced. And that couldn't be farther from the truth, particularly for this gun, the, uh, the blue and gray commemorative series, and for what are known as the C series that followed them. Because these guns are really Colts, and I'm going to explain that. So what Val did is he went to Italy, went to a birdie, and he got rough forgings for the barrel, the cylinder, and the back strap. Okay? Now when I say rough forgings, you may picture something that needs, say, a lot of polishing. <laughs> well, you're way off if that's what you're thinking. I should say these rough castings uh, really almost don't even resemble the part that they are going to be. That's how much metal is left on them. So they still have to be forged and machined and, you know, bored and drilled and the whole nine yards and brought to finished dimensions. Um, so it's not just a matter of polishing them up and screwing them on or anything. Uh, there's a lot of work to do on those. So, so that's it. Barrel, cylinder, backstrap. Everything else, frame, trigger guard, loading lever, all the action parts, the hammer, uh, everything else in the gun, all the screws, the nipples, springs, all made by Colt at the Colt plant. I gotta adjust this again. Okay, so Colt wrote a 125-page spec book on how to build each of these guns. And it's incredibly detailed. It goes through all the dimensions, all the materials, you know, the finish, everything that's going to be done on the gun and the sequence is going to be done. And they were all done in the Colt facility in Hartford. So this gun is a Colt. I mean, the fact that it had some rough Italian parts on it, notwithstanding, because Colt gets a lot of parts from different suppliers anyway for all of their guns. It's just it's the nature of, of the industry. So it's a real Colt. You can get a Colt letter on it. Okay, so that, that said, 
uh, I hope that takes away some of the confusion. I did a, a video on the 1860 Army second generation, uh, which is a little bit different. That was an F-series gun. And by then, the work was not being done in Colt's plant. It was being done in the Ivor Johnson plant in Connecticut. But the same work, they were using Colt specs, it was inspected by Colt the whole bit, right? So, so if you've got the C-series or an F-series gun, those are the second generation guns. They are Colts. If you've got the Colt Signature Series, that was all done in Italy by Uberti. It's got super nice finish. Uh, I think the finishes were done by Ivor Johnson, but the gun was all built by Uberti. So that's, that's where the misconception came in that the second generation guns are really just Italian guns. Uh, but I just want to make it clear, they are not. They are Colts. Well, I'll tell you one other technical thing about this gun that surprised me. Of course, if you saw my kind of unboxing video, the first look, you know that this gun's never been shot and it was packed in 50 years of hardened Cosmoline. Uh, so I've had this whole thing apart, but I hadn't really looked at the rifling, and, and a friend of mine, Kaido Ojama, who some of you I'm sure know, he does uh, Kaido's bullets, um, the heavy hunting bullets for Capimol revolvers. Uh, Kaido asked me if this gun has the progressive rifling, you know, the gain twist rifling, like the originals. So I, I took a look. Now, i got to be honest, I did not expect this to. And the reason I didn't is because Colt uh, built these guns, they made the parts for them, on the machines that they used to make the parts for the single action army. And the single action army does not have gain twist rifling. Um, in fact, Colt stopped gain twist rifling with the single action army in 1873 because they decided that it really didn't get you any benefits. It was just more expensive to do. So I kind of thought that they would probably just have, you know, standard uh, standard pitch rifling. But when I took the barrel off and took a look at it, it looks certainly looks like game twist rifling to me. Uh, like the original. I mean, I've got an original 1851. I looked at both barrels. They looked about the same. So it looks like Colt did use a game twist rifling in in the Robert E. Lee and I assume in the Ulysses Grant commemorative guns. So, just something to point out. So, Anyway, when, when Colt got together with Val Forget, they had to decide what they were going to produce. And, you know, it was kind of a no-brainer because the 1851 Colt Navy revolver was the second most popular gun of the cap and ball era. The only gun that sold more was the Colt 1849 pocket model. Uh, and that's the way things go today. People go for the compact gun more often than the full-size gun, but if you live somewhere where you can carry a full-size gun, you were going for the Colt Navy. And they sold scads of those. They sold over 200,000 of them before they discontinued it in 1873. So Colt's thinking is, uh, you know, pretty linear. That if that's the most popular cap and ball gun we had, that's the cap and ball gun we should start off reissuing. And that's what they did. Uh, but they decided to up the ante a little bit. And instead of just coming out with the 1851 Navy, they came out with the blue and gray cassettes, the commemoratives. And those started off with a dual cassette of the Robert E. Lee pistol, like I showed you, and a Ulysses S. Grant Navy, uh, boxed up together with the accoutrements and the whole bit, uh, and a medallion. And they did 250 of those combined sets.
So it was the first 250 guns that they put on the market were Grant and Lee uh, joint commemorative guns. And they're beautiful, just beautiful. And the only real difference between the Grant and the Lee is that the Lee has the uh, small oval trigger guard. Right? And the Grant gun has the square backed trigger guard, uh, which I am not as fond of, which is one of the reasons why I've been looking for a Lee commemorative gun. So the first 250, which is actually 500 guns, went into the combined uh, blue and gray commemorative set. After that, they started producing individual box sets for the Ulysses S. Grant and the, uh, the Robert E. Lee. And they produced 4,500 of each of those. So there are quite a few of them out there. It's, a, you know, it's not that rare, though they do command a pretty good premium. So following their success with the blue and gray commemoratives, uh, they began to issue the 1851 Navy. So following Colt's success with the blue and gray commemorative series, they began to produce just straight 1851 navies. And those are known as the C-Series Colts. And that's because the serial number range for those guns starts with C. And those were all produced in the Colt plant. So if you've got a C-Series gun, it was made by Colt. Uh, the, the next range of second generations were the F-Series, and those were actually made in the Ivor Johnson plant to Colt specs. So if you've got a C-Series gun, you've got the Coltiest Colt black powder gun. So that's, that's the story of the Lee and Grant commemorative sets. So now that you know the history behind them, uh, let's load this gun up and shoot it for the first time ever since it was made over 50 years ago. Well, I'm going to load the, uh, the Robert E. Lee Colt with round balls. I'm going to use 375, 0.375 inch round balls. I'm going to load it with five. You can load it with six, that's fine. Put it on half cock so the cylinder spins. Now, I was hoping to be able to load it right from this beautiful powder flask, but the flask throws a 30 grain powder charge, which is appropriate for a Colt Army, but not appropriate for this. So I'm going to use it to uh, just to charge up this measure. Now I'm going to load with 20 grains of 3FG Go-X powder. And yes, I do have some Go-X left. So I'm just going to pour it in. Now, I like to load with a lubricated felt wad between the powder and the ball. So I'm going to put that on here. Try to sorry, doing this around the camera is always a pain in the butt. I'd like to kind of get that wad seated in a little bit. Then we can put a ball on it, rotate it under the loading lever, and just seat it down. So I'm going to load five like that, and then we're going to go cap them up and shoot them. Just a couple of observations on loading this thing. Uh, I'm using 375 balls. I probably could have used 380 in this easily. The uh, chambers are generous. And the nipples are quite narrow. So my Remington number 10 caps were falling off them. I had to pinch them to put them on. Uh, CCI number 11s would definitely be too big. They might fit CCI number 10s, and this would be the only gun I've ever seen <laughs> that would fit CCI number 10s if it does. I don't happen to have any to try, so I, I can't confirm that. But 
but the nipples are quite narrow, much more narrow than on the Italian guns. Well, let's go out and shoot it, see how it does. Well, Evil Roy is up to his old tricks, terrorizing the good people of Blymeyer's Hollow. So I guess I'm going to have to take Robert E. Lee here and shoot him for the first time in his 50-year life to stop Evil Roy's depredations. So let's see how old Mars Bob does. Well, the gun shot just fine as far as accuracy goes. Kind of wanted to jam up a little bit when we first got going. But now, seems to be okay. So I might have got a cap down in the works. Well, I'm going to load up the Colt Robert E. Lee commemorative with some paper cartridges. There we go. A little while ago, we had a snow flurry that came through. I thought my day was done, but uh, now sun's broken back out again. You can almost feel my fingers. So I've got uh, got the Robert E. Lee loaded up with paper cartridges, and let's see if I can take out that water bottle. Well, it looks like I actually hit it twice. I thought I only got it once, but I caught it once up high. And then the second time I caught it down low and both bullets just drilled right through. Didn't knock the, uh, the bottle over at all, which is kind of a surprise. Well, I've got a few parting thoughts. First of all, the weather today was a challenge. Uh, We've had sunshine, we've had high winds, it has been very cold, it's in the 30s. My little fingers are quite numb. So all of that made it a challenge to, uh, to shoot this gun. But I had a good time with it. Now like most, most of these Colt navies, it shoots very high. So I'm still trying to figure that out on some targets. But... Uh, it's very comfortable to shoot, feels good in your hand, as, as they all do. Dimensionally, it's got some surprising differences from the Italian guns. As I said, the nipples are quite a bit uh, narrower. Uh, caps are very loose on them. Chambers are generously sized. Uh, I would say they're a little bit bigger than Uberti chambers. So, that was kind of different. Of course, it's got the, uh, the gain twist rifling progressive rifling. So all of that makes it a little bit of a different beast to shoot than the usual Italian replicas, but quite a bit of fun. It's beautiful. Balance is nice. Uh, I definitely enjoyed shooting it. I got some cap jams with it. If this was going to be an everyday shooter, which it will not be, uh, I would probably put slick shot nipples on it and I would do some work on the, the face of the hammer. There's a little bit of sharp edges over there that I think could cure the cap jamming, but uh, on the whole, it's a beautiful piece. Now one thing, of course, it is cold, and because I wanted to honor Robert E. Lee, I'm kind of wearing my gray, but I didn't have a coat to wear, and I've been thinking lately uh, that it's probably time that I upgrade my kit. Now I'm not a Civil War reenactor, I'm, I'm sure quite a few of you are out there. And anybody who wants to give me some leads on a uh, on good vendors, because I'd like to get both a Union and a Confederate sack coat to use just when making videos. I, you know, in the past I'd kind of stayed away from Civil War guns per se, but 
these last two years I've been doing a lot more of them. And I like to honor the gun uh, by dressing the part. So I like to get an authentic sack coat for the Union Army and one for the Confederate Army to, to wear for videos. So I'd like some leads on either vendors or uh, tailors or seamstresses that you all use who uh, can provide stuff in big boy sizes like I wear. So feel free to let me know in the comments or you can uh, email me at mike.bellevue at hotmail.com uh, or just go to mikebellevue.com and use the contact me section there and that will get an email right to me and let me know who I should be talking to so I can get myself outfitted properly. So other than that, I had fun with Robert E. Lee here. He's a beautiful piece. I'm going to cherish him. And he'll certainly get shot again. Uh, and until I see you again, bye.